Um, I'm going to swiftly move on to our next uh, discussion, which is a um, panel. Unfortunately, Albino Drapella won't be making it, uh, but we have Ewan, Kate, and Sandra. So, um, Ewan, I, you are going to go first, um, and on to you if you can hear me. Oh, maybe you're muted. You okay. okay. Okay, you were muted. That's... I just unmuted you. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Hannah. Um, thanks for inviting me to speak. Um, and I've tried to stick to the title that you've given us, um, uh, horrendous as it looks, effective use of heritage studies and its methodology, thinking about societal benefit and economic value, the role of stakeholders and development of policy. So really a, a fascinating um, bag of tricks uh, to, to get stuck into there. Um, so um, what, I've, what I really want to do is, um, uh, my starting point is really th that we find ourselves right now in, a, in a, a very unique period of time with a global pandemic where there's an opportunity for the heritage sector to engage with others as we more widely reconsider and recalibrate many aspects of society. And it's important to consider what is the role of heritage and culture in this. Um, is our sector to play a part? Can we make a positive contribution? What are the consequences if we don't? Um, are we seen as an obstacle or, or something that's not relevant? And key to this is the presence of a green recovery agenda and as part of the planning for economic recovery um, and the opportunities to reframe many aspects of how we live in order to meet climate change objectives. So I'd like to touch on some of the key issues where cultural heritage can make a contribution to climate action at this time and in a way that utilises fundamental core aspects of our sector, uh, such as our role in stewardship and promoting conservation of assets that we already have, making them more of the richness of heritage and culture and the wider value that it has to offer, um, in a way the equivalent of natural capital, if you like. Um, the potential of retrofit to play a significant part in greenhouse gas reduction through the avoidance of exploitation of new resources as well as improvements in operational energy through energy efficiency and the importance of place and heritage in supporting communities through times of change. The, the rapid reduction of global greenhouse gas emissions remains a major international priority if countries are to meet the requirements of the Paris Agreement. And if there's hope of keeping global warming below two degrees, something of course that the world is currently not on track to do. And emissions reduction um, will feature very strongly in the run up uh, to COP26. For buildings and the construction sector, resource efficiency is a major issue. Uh, and making the most of what we already have through refurbishment, adaptation and retrofit is key to reducing emissions. In the UK, the construction sector is responsible for 45% of our greenhouse gas emissions. It's the biggest consumer of natural resources and it contributes over a third of the UK's total waste. Yet we know that 80% of the buildings we have, we will have in 2050, have already been built. And a significant proportion of these are of traditional construction. And this is the case in many areas of the world, not just the UK. So the opportunity is there for the heritage sector to promote the adaptive reuse of buildings and heritage assets to reduce greenhouse gases and avoid new emissions from construction of new buildings. A significant part of this is the contribution is, is contributing understanding of practices from the past that are inherently sustainable, such as building materials, supply chains, as well as passive design features of traditional building systems for example, thermal massing, natural ventilation, solar gain, and so forth. And these aspects can provide valuable lessons today to reduce the need for energy intensive building systems and importantly can challenge the often perceived need for over intensive renovation of existing buildings during retrofit. The wider benefits of retrofit are significant. Work being done in Scotland just now, looking at infrastructure investment options for economic recovery, is showing that the best prospects for job creation are also green projects. 
and energy efficiency improvements and retrofit has been shown to deliver the highest employment multiplier of any sector. In other words, it has the, the biggest potential to create jobs from investment through economic stimulus. And in addition to that, retrofit also has the highest score for wider social and economic benefits, partly through creating rewarding jobs and training opportunities. In, in parallel to this is thinking around the importance of place. And in Scotland, the place principle has been adopted to allow better understanding of the value of place and identity to communities. The current pandemic has highlighted for many of us the importance of our local shops and services. For example, we're hearing about the, the 20 minute neighborhood where you can shop locally and travel on foot or, or by bike. And this aligns with many traditional patterns of settlement and living, and also with the practice of heritage-led regeneration. And of course, it has climate action at its core. And this comes at a time when changing retail patterns and the nature of our workplaces and offices may change the face of our high streets for good. The city of Glasgow has recently published a city centre living strategy with the aim of doubling the residential population in the centre by 2035. This includes the repurposing of commercial, um, redundant commercial space, and with specific actions to convert heritage buildings rather than create new buildings. It also acknowledges the value of high quality public space for people's lives and well-being. And that new strategy sits alongside the target set last year by the, the city's climate emergency working group for Glasgow to become carbon neutral by 2030. So there are significant opportunities for the heritage sector in these areas, but there's also significant challenges too, not least the adoption of heritage knowledge and expertise into planning and policy. There's also fiscal issues, of course, in the UK in that value added tax imposes a 20% tax rate on repair and maintenance and refurbishment of existing buildings, yet new build developments are tax free. And I think we as a sector need to communicate better and quantify the contribution that older buildings can make to emissions reduction and also to the wider value uh, of traditional systems and patterns uh, of construction. The Just Transition Agenda concerns the shift to environmentally and socially sustainable jobs and economic opportunities, which can address issues of inequality and poverty. The potential for retrofit to create rewarding jobs and support sustainable supply chains is being increasingly recognized, but Heritage has a much wider role to play in supporting climate action through harnessing creativity and inspiration from arts and culture and to, preside, to provide resilience to communities in times of change through, for example, creating awareness of traditional local practices, many of which are inherently sustainable and well adapted. Heritage can also support change by providing an understanding and documenting the loss of traditional livelihoods and practices, such as that recorded by our industrial heritage in the UK and former industries such as coal mining and fishing. And even if past transitions have not been successful and in some cases are uncomfortable, heritage has value in supporting communities through future change and providing lessons for aspects such as economic diversification and reskilling. Another area that the COVID pandemic has brought into focus is tourism and the opportunity to build on existing thinking within the heritage sector around sustainable tourism and climate change. There are, of course, obvious challenges as an industry that creates significant economic and social benefits, yet which through rapidly increasing visitor numbers has a negative aspect in terms of carbon footprint and emissions from travel, as well as in some cases detrimental uh, physical impact on heritage sites from over tourism. Cli climate change is already driving thinking towards more sustainable models of tourism that can continue to deliver benefits to communities, but do not rely on the previous models of mass tourism and volume tourism that many of us are familiar with. There is scope for fresh thinking and innovation in this area and has been brought into immediate focus by the current 
pandemic, which may itself fundamentally shift tourism patterns in the medium to longer term. So finally, I, I've spoken in a, in a positive way about the contribution that cultural heritage can make to delivering climate action and highlighted both opportunities and challenges that need to be addressed. The, the fundamental stewardship of existing buildings and heritage assets that lies at the core of our sector provides a range of opportunities to offer solutions in terms of the efficient use of resources, reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, making a positive contribution to support societal change. But there are other significant challenges for the heritage sector if we are to support climate action. And in particular, I think there's a need to examine our own limitations in terms of potential change to cultural significance of heritage values. Some of this is inevitable and is being addressed through discussions around loss, uh, driven by uh, direct physical threats to heritage assets from climate change impacts. However, th there's a need for our sector to acknowledge this challenge and to develop frameworks on which um, to assess potential tensions between climate actions and the conservation of heritage values. Thank you.